high intensity exercise is appropriate for even the aging population. Okay, and we're going to do it in a little bit of the context of what we see here, which is neurodegenerative diseases are going to come out here and there every once in a while, talking about things like Alzheimer's disease, things like Parkinson's disease, a little bit about MS are going to come in every once in a while as we go through this. We're going to talk a lot about what kind of things are appropriate for the aging population in order to get the most gains out of what you do for exercise on a daily basis. Okay, so first things first, no matter what we do, we are not going to stop the aging process, okay? But even just a moderate amount of exercise can do several things for us, all right? It can minimize the physiologic effects of an otherwise sedentary lifestyle. So as we age, the research shows that we spend more time sitting. We spend more time not being as active as we used to be. And one of the things we can do to combat that is to incorporate exercise that's going to do just the opposite. It's going to get us moving. And even just a little bit of that combats that sedentary lifestyle and all those changes that happen from it. All right, it increased active life expectancy. Not how many years you will live, but how many years you will live actively, okay? How long you will be able to be on your own, how long you'll be able to keep walking, how long you'll be able to do all the things that we want everyone to keep doing. It limits the development of chronic diseases, okay? This talks about any, almost any chronic disease if you look at how it develops, almost all of them develop, have some point where it speeds up when we're inactive. All right, so being active and exercising regularly helps to combat, combat that. It also decreases fall risk. And as a physical therapist, this is one of our main concerns. We see often that as people fall, all the other things happen a lot faster. So we talk, see chronic conditions come faster. We see that you stop moving as much after you fall. And those are all things we want to prevent, okay? So, talking a little bit about falling. One of our big concerns when people fall is that they get hurt, okay? Not just that they fall, but what they, how they hurt themselves. One of the leading ways that they get hurt is they break a hip or they fracture their femur, okay? So these femoral fractures, not only are they common, but they result in a high morbidity rate, meaning that they come along with a lot of other things. All right, if you have fracture your hip, it leads to other problems down the road, okay? They also have a high mortality rate, okay? We don't like that one, okay? And it's the leading medical cost in the nation for older adults, all right? Right there, just by itself, okay? Falls by themselves are also the leading cause of fatal and non-fatal injuries in the older adult population. Okay, you can see why as physical therapists we start to get really concerned when someone falls. And we want to do everything we can to help prevent it. And exercise is one of the leading ways we can do that, especially in people who are already healthy that we're just trying to prevent them from ever getting to the point where they fall. Okay. So, we're going to talk a little about, about potential causes and potential things that can lead to a fall. All right. Within this, especially being here, we're going to talk about a few that are disease specific, specific to the things that we see here at the Cleveland Clinic, Luruo Center for Brain Health. All right, this includes things like abnormal movements, postural changes, difficulty doing two things at once. This one's really common and one that people often don't think about. But as our brain changes and as we age, it's harder for us to do two things at once. Okay. And when we have a condition that limits that, our brain doesn't auto it automatically is going to prioritize the part that we're thinking about more than what we're doing. Okay? So if you're walking and you're trying to call someone on your phone or you're trying to read your grocery list or whatever you're trying to do, your body or your brain is not going to be thinking about what your body is doing. It's going to be thinking about what you're trying to do. Okay? And so your balance can suffer, your walking can suffer, and it puts you at a lot higher risk for falling. Um, cognitive deficits also put us at risk for falling. Can help, may, may make it so we make decisions we would otherwise not make that may make us unsafe. All right, daytime sleepiness. With Parkinson's disease, we see a lot of freezing, all right, as part of their abnormal movement. This means that when they go to move, they feel stuck to the ground. They can't make that movement they want to make and definitely can be a le one of the leading causes of falls within that population. Weakness, and also rigidity, meaning that you don't move as smoothly and your body doesn't want to make as big of a movement as you normally would. All right, all of these things 
are very specific that can lead to a fall. Now, we're going to talk about things that within the environment. And these are the ones where you can really have a, an effect. You can really make a change is going through these pieces that can affect a fall that are in your environment. These include things that you've probably heard before. Things like poor lighting, loose rugs, clutter, pets, going from different floor surfaces like carpet and tile, um, busy environments, and also open environments. Okay? What was that? So the question was, what is a busy environment? A busy environment is something like when you're at the mall, where there's lots of people around, there's lots of different things coming. I like to say Disneyland, think of that, okay? There's all sorts of people going forward or across in front of you and you have to, your brain has to process all of that information and help you to make a good decision about what your movement needs to be in order so that you can keep your balance and stay safe, okay? And that's why a busy environment is difficult sometimes to negotiate because there's so many different things to pay attention to, all right? So there's also other causes of falls, and we just kind of lump these into the other category, all right? These are things that otherwise we haven't really talked about, things like medications. Side effects of medications are also met the interactions of different medications, all right, that may put you at risk for a fall. This is something to talk to your doctor about if you have a fall, is, well, could it be how my medications are working together that made me so that I wasn't as balanced or that I, you know, that I passed out or whatever it may have been that led to your fall, okay? Visual deficits. Vision is one of the key things we use to keep our balance. It's one of the main ways that we're able to adjust and know that what we're feeling in our body for balance is actually correct. So without our vision, it's really hard to keep our balance. It's really hard for us to prevent some of the falls. It's easy for us to trip, okay? And then we have other conditions that may affect it. Things that result in aches and pains, numbness, um, any, any other weakness that may be coming from any other condition you may have, okay? So when we talk about preventing falls, there's several things we can do, all right? One that we sometimes suggest as physical therapists, if appropriate, use an assistive, assistive device. That means something like a cane or a walker, all right? If it's something you need, use it. It's gonna make you safer. Um, if you don't need it, then you don't need to use it, okay? But if it's something you need, definitely use it. It will keep you safe, keep you from falling, all right? Schedule a yearly eye exam. This is one that not everyone does and not everyone thinks about as something that keeps you safe from a fall. But yearly eye exams are very important, just as how I was talking about with vision, all right? This is why it's so important to keep you safe, all right? So, leading back to that last slide, look at all those environmental causes that we talked about, things like pets, clutter, all right, those things, those are all things that we can adjust, we can change somehow to make it so it's safer around us, so we don't have to worry about falling as much, all right? And lastly, and the big one we're gonna talk about today is stay active and exercise, okay? Just doing that makes a big difference in how our body can prevent falls. Okay, so we're gonna talk about a little bit about what the research is out there currently for exercise and why it's important within our population within the older adult population okay so first things first the timing of exercise is important and it says here earlier is better okay that doesn't mean if you haven't started exercising yet it's too late but we're going to talk about in the next couple slides how as we as if the sooner we get going the better we're going to see those results okay so it's an encouragement to start today that's really what it's there for okay the sooner we do it the better all right we're gonna talk a lot about this part, vigorous or high intensity exercise. The reason that it's so important is that it impacts the brain and the brain function more than just doing light or even just self-selected, meaning what you would choose to do for exercise. So we're looking for things that push you because they really make a difference in how your brain functions. All right, so this goes, this next bullet talks a little bit about that. There, this one I thought was very interesting. There was a study done that had two groups of people. One group rode a bicycle by themselves and were told to push themselves, try, told to go fast. The other group got on a tandem bicycle with a professional cyclist and, and were just told to, to bicycle, all right? The group that pedaled with the professional cyclist had a lot more benefits for their brain than the group that didn't, all right? They, they saw that their cognition was better, they moved better. They were, these were people with Parkinson's disease. They saw less of those Parkinson's disease symptoms within this group. 
Um, and it's something that just giving that extra push to really have to push yourself harder, it makes a big difference in the way the brain functions. All right, and last thing, inactivity and stress are pro-degenerative, meaning that they lead to further degeneration, further furthering that aging process. So exercise is really important to keep the opposite going. We're trying to protect the brain and protect the body. All right. So as we go through this, we're going to use a talk about a couple words and what they mean because this is what we're after from a neurologic perspective with exercise. We're after something called neuroplasticity. That that word means the ability for our brain to change and adapt. All right? All of us have it. Our brains do it on a daily basis. All right? It's how we learn. It's how when we're in school, it's how we learn something new. All right? And our brain keeps doing it all the way through our lives. All right? We talk about this in several different stages, okay? When we're talking about prevention, which is where we like to where we want everyone to be, is trying to trying to prevent anything from, from going wrong with the brain or preventing falls, we're talking about neuroprotection. We're trying to protect the brain, okay? Neuroprotection, protect the brain, all right? Now, once we start seeing symptoms of something's going, going on, we start having falls, we aren't as sharp as we used to be, all right? Now we start talking about things like neurorepair, okay? So we're trying to get the brain and the nervous system to repair back to what it used to be, all right? And we can, exercise is a good way for us to work on that. Now, the, as we get later on and we start seeing more of these impairments start coming, we talk about something called neuroadaption. Now, this is when the brain can't go all the way back to how it was normally, so it's going to change and adapt so that we can try and recover as much as we can of what we used to be able to do, okay? So, just kind of keep those in mind. Again, our goal is we want the neuroprotection phase. We want as many people as we can. We want to get it early. Remember, timing's important. We want to start early, and that's why. We want to get it when we're just trying to protect the brain. If we can protect the brain, we stay there a lot longer. We don't have to worry about the other stages as much. Okay? So, let's talk about some guidelines for exercise. First, we want you to be as active as your body and your condition allow you to be. We want to do exercise that not only addresses your strength and your endurance, but also your balance. Okay? It can keep you safe. As we talked about falls, balance plays a big piece. There's other things too, but balance is very important with that. All right? And understand how your current condition all right, affects your ability to do regular exercise. Okay? That's individual to each person. Know how your body is going to respond. <coughs> Pay attention to it and adjust as necessary what, for, for what you do for exercise, okay? So this, this slide here talks about how not just exercise, but vigorous exercise affects our body more than performing light or self-selected exercise, the exercise you would just choose to do, okay? So it showed, there's lots of research out there on this one, and, um, but it sh the research shows that people who exercise vigorously meaning they really push themselves. We'll talk about what that means in a little bit. They had better gait mechanics. They walked better, all right? They walked more quickly, all right? They had lower fall risk. They had better dynamic balance. That is when you're moving, they were able to keep their balance better. They, had, they were more independent. They had less risk of becoming, um, of losing their independence. All right, which is a big thing as we age. We want to keep people as independent as possible for as long as possible. They were less depressed. They had decreased occurrence of type 2 diabetes. They had decreased mortality rate. They had increased intended weight loss. They had decreased incidence of kidney disease. They had improved cardiac health. They had decreased incidence of falls, and they had less decline in cognition. That's a long list of things. And that's just the first one. I mean, I found that in the first 15 minutes looking. All right, there's more out there. All right, vigorous exercise over light exercise. Remember, these are people, the group that they're comparing to isn't, not, isn't doing no exercise. They're still exercising. They're just not doing as intensive exercise. So the intensity of exercise gives you all these added benefits. All right, okay. Something to keep in mind, the CDC, Center for Disease Control, puts out a recommended guidelines for exercise for the adult population. 
only 25% of all adults adhere to those guidelines, okay? Within that population, those 25% of people they found had fewer chronic conditions, they were less depressed, less mobility restrictions, and they had higher exercise self-efficacy, which means they thought that exercise was really gonna help those, compared to people who didn't exercise, okay? So we want to get everyone into that 25%. We wanna get that a little bit bigger, all right? And we start here, okay? That's what we're gonna talk about a little bit next, okay? Our types of exercise that we're gonna talk about are aerobic or cardiovascular exercise, strength training, flexibility, and balance, okay? These are the four pillars that I talked about the center of disease control. These are the ones that they recommend that we do. And we're gonna talk about their recommendations and how we can incorporate high intensity exercise into the, their recommendations, okay? Aerobic exercise. This means things that get your heart rate up, get you maybe a little bit sweaty, a little short of breath, okay? The benefits we see, weight management, reduce fatigue, maintain mobility, improve mental health, and mood, improve sleep, and reduce cardiovascular disease risks, okay? Lots of things, lots of things we heard before, huh? You're gonna see that pattern. A lot of these things help the same things, all right? So, the CDC recommends that we do these three to seven days a week, all right? About 30 minutes per day, all right? So, we're gonna come back to that slide in just a second. All right, you're, we wanna talk about intensity within this, okay? This is things like walking, jogging, riding a bicycle, swimming, anything like that. Think, like I said, things that get your heart rate up, sweaty, short of breath, all right? So we have two intensities that we're gonna talk about. Moderate intensity. This is something that basically when you're doing, you get a short, enough, short of breath enough that you can hold a conversation, but you can't sing, all right? That's one way you can tell, all right? <laughs> Doesn't matter if you sing good, you can, you can, sit, you can still test, <laughs> all right? So our part, we also, one of the things I wanted to talk about today is heart rate, because this is one of the best ways we can measure intensity, okay? For this moderate intensity, we term it 60 to 75% of our heart rate maximum, all right? On this slide, there's some calculations you could do to figure that out. On, the ne on the, our next slide, I'm gonna show you an easier way as well, okay? Um, we also want to talk about vigorous exercise. Going back to our analogy here, for vigorous exercise, you can't hold a conversation anymore. It's too hard. You're too short of breath. You can't sing either, okay? You can say a few words at a time, all right? It's, you can just go a little bit, and then you have to take a breath, okay? Because you, you're working hard enough that your body has to get that oxygen in, okay? So that's what we're looking for. That's 75 to 90% of our heart rate maximum, okay? Now, let's talk about how we find those numbers for each one of you. There's calculations here. We're gonna use a chart that's a little bit easier on this last page, okay? So this chart that we're looking at right now is just what we're talking about, okay? That maximum heart rate number that you can see way over there in that last column, all right? That's the number that we're talking about, the percentage that we want to get to, all right? This first column is the age, okay? Anywhere from 40 to 100, all right? Now, for vigorous intensity, that means we want to get 75 to 90% of our heart rate maximum. So, for someone who is 60 years old, if we want to get out to 75, we'd be starting at 125 beats per minute with their heart. All right, up to 90%, up to uh, almost 150. All right, and you can do that for yourself. You can find those frames. Vigorous intensity is where we're, what I'm talking about today. That's where we see our benefits. You can actually decrease your exercise time and still get benefits from it when you do vigorous intensity exercise over moderate intensity exercise. Um, and this is a chart you can reference back for yourself to be able to recognize that. Yeah, we have a question. Yeah. If you take a beta blocker, doesn't it tend to decrease these numbers? Yes. The question was, if you take a beta blocker, doesn't that affect these numbers? And it does. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. There are several conditions or several medications you need to be aware of that make this method of monitoring your intensity not accurate. And a beta blocker is one of those. And we'll, we'll address that here in a, in a minute. All right. So skipping forward. Now, how can you tell your heart rate? Okay? Because now I've talked about we can 
find our intensity by knowing what our heart rate is, there's several ways we can do that. We'll start with the most simple. You don't need anything but your body, okay? You can find your pulse by taking one hand, sticking it straight out in front of you, reaching with two <coughs> fingers right across onto your wrist, just on the, right by the thumb, okay? Kind of push down on those bones and feel, okay? Everybody got that? Okay. There's another spot, if you can't find it there, you can go up to your elbow, okay? If you bend your elbow a little bit, you're gonna feel a tendon kind of poke out into your hands. If you go just to the inside of that, and you push a little bit harder, you'll be able to feel it there as well, okay? Those are the two best spots. We don't like people to go up here, okay? We don't like people to go up there because they can cut off their oxygen supply a little bit to the brain, okay? <laughs> Yes, we don't, we don't want to cut that one off. We're, we're trying to keep the brain healthy. So these two are much better options than going up to the neck. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so when, if you're going to take your pulse this way to find out what your heart rate is, there's a specific way to do it. We want you to count starting at zero, not at one. So zero, one, two, three. Every time that heart beats for 15 seconds. After you go 15 seconds, you multiply that by four, and you have your number, okay? All right, another easier way to do it, all right, is we recommend heart rate monitors to lots of our patients so that they can monitor this a lot easier, all right? The, the kind of heart rate monitors that we recommend are the ones that strap across the chest and then they usually tell you your heart rate on something like a watch, all right? Kind of like what the pic picture is here up on the screen, all right? They're a lot more accurate than the ones that you can just put on your finger or that you have on your phone, or any of those kind, all right? Not that those ones are bad. If that's all you've got, use it, all right? But these are the most accurate, and that's why we recommend them, okay? You can find these at any sporting goods store, online, if you're an Amazon shopper, lots of people are. That's a great spot to find them. You can find them just about um, at any sporting goods store, though, for sure. All right, so now we get to that cautions page, all right? So heart rate is, one of, is our ideal way of measuring your intensity. Problem is it doesn't work for everyone, okay? If you have, take certain medications for, to manage your heart, heart rate, or have had a previous cardiac event, you'll want to talk to your doctor about the medications you're taking before you start using this method to monitor your intensity. Things like a pacemaker will also change it it won't be accurate, okay? So this isn't a good measure of, of your intensity if you have a pacemaker, all right? With this, also remember it's really important when we're doing especially vigorous exercise, we have a warm up and a cool down. This means we slowly ramp up that intensity over the first five to 10 minutes, and then when we're done, we slowly slow back down. We don't just stop, okay? It's really important, it allows our body to adjust back down to normal. Especially as we get older, this is really important for our vascular system, okay? All right, so we've kind of talked a little bit about this. Um, the intensity that we're looking for is vigorous, high intensity, okay? Things to think about doing, jogging or running. Swimming laps, if you're bicycling, more than 10 miles per hour is usually what we need to get it up to this intensity we're looking for. Jumping rope, heavy gardening, hiking uphill, one of my favorites, boxing, okay? This is one of the best ways, and this actually covers all these categories we're talking about today, to get very high intensity exercise in an, ab in an unconventional way, all right? When we're talking about boxing, we're not talking about hitting somebody else, we're talking about going through and training, all right? Really working hard, um, and we'll talk more about that in the, as we get closer to the end, all right? So, moving away from aerobic training, now we're going to talk a little bit about strength training, okay? So, this is things that are going to build our muscle strength, help us to maintain bone density, improve our balance, coordination, and mobility, it helps to reduce our risk of falling, and maintain our independence, okay? So, this is things like weightlifting, or doing things that are stressful on our muscles, things that can make us maybe a little bit sore the day or two afterwards, okay? And that's all right. As long as it doesn't last for more than three or four days, that's fine. It's okay to be a little bit sore. It's good for our body. As you do it more, you'll be less sore, all right? Again, the warm up and cool down are important. They can help you feel less sore as you go and do some of this strength training, all right? 
two to three times a week is the recommended number of times. Two to three times a week, that covers basically the whole body. All right, big, we wanna make sure we hit all the big muscle groups. So I love to tell people do things like squats because it incorporates your legs, your back, a lot of your body, all right? Do things that try, if you're doing arm exercise, don't do it sitting down, do it standing up, all right? All those different things, just try and get all of your body to work when you're doing this exercise. Flexibility. Now this can be more important depending on your current condition, how your posture is, things like that. Um, but it can lead to better posture, can lead to less muscle tension and less muscle soreness. Um, it can reduce our risk of injury and it can also lead to more relaxation, again, better mood, less depression, okay? Um, it's recommended anywhere from two to seven times a week depending on how you currently are. If you need work on making sure that your posture is better or that you feel like you get stiff really fast, seven days a week is great. Otherwise, if you feel good, two days a week may be fine for you, okay? But it's something that's important that we keep doing. As our body ages, as we do less, we tend to get more stiff because we're not moving through as big of a motion as we used to. So flexibility becomes more and more important. All right, and lastly, balance, okay? So big one that we love, reduces the risk of injury and falls, or injury from falls and falls in general. It also reduces our ability, or improves our ability to get out into the community, all right? So we're not staying at home because we're worried that we're going to fall, or we're worried we're gonna encounter something that we're not used to that's gonna throw our balance off. It allows us to get up and down stairs, negotiate curbs, go on the grass, go hiking, go, do anything that's a little bit out of the ordinary just walking, all right? Balance for everyone is recommended on a daily basis, all right? I tell my patients the perfect way to do this is to incorporate it into your daily routine. So if you're brushing your teeth, it's my favorite one, and it's hard for you to stand with your feet together already, well do that while you're brushing your teeth, all right? It gives you something that every day you're going to be able to practice your balance because it's something you have to do every day. All right? If it's hard for you to balance on one foot, balance, try and balance on one foot while you're washing a dish. All right? <laughs> something like that. It's something that you're going to do on a daily basis so that you get this balance work right in. All right. All right, we have a question. Yes? Well, the, the, the Skechers Shape Up shoes yes. rock. Yes, they and do. That really helps your balance as well. Yeah, so the question was, the Skechers Shape Up shoes, they rock, and that can help your balance as well. It can. Make sure you're safe when you use them. Um, it, we don't want people using them who have bad balance already because it makes it harder for you to keep your balance, which is why your balance gets better, because you're working on it all the time. Um, it's fine if you are healthy and you don't have any, balance, any severe balance problems, you're not at risk for falling, but be aware if you do. It may be something that's not appropriate for you, okay? All right, so we didn't talk about intensity with these last three categories, strength, flexibility, and balance. All right, they can also be, we can also incorporate high intensity exercise with each one of them as well. All right, we can do this, we do this a little bit different. It's not necessarily gonna get your heart rate up the way aerobic exercise will. All right, so we use something called the re, or perceived exertion scale. All right, and that is what you're seeing up here on the screen, the scale from, from one to 10, all right? For high intensity or vigorous intensity exercise, we are aiming for where those red arrows are. Either a nine, nine to seven in that range, which is really hard. <laughs> Basically, it says vigorous intensity to very hard. All right, that's where we wanna be. Can barely breathe, speak only a few words. Can speak maybe a sentence. All right, we kinda of talked about that before. That's where we're at, that's where we want to get to. All right, this is another thing if you have a heart condition that may not allow you to use heart rate, this is another scale you can use to see if you're at the correct intensity. All right, remember getting here sometimes requires more than how you would normally push yourself. Sometimes it may require somebody else to kind of help you get there, encourage you, all right? So doing things that are extremely challenging is appropriate but be safe while doing it. This applies mostly to balance, okay? It's appropriate to challenge yourself, and it's appropriate for it to be hard, but make sure you're safe as you do so, okay? So, 
Let's talk about what we need to do to get something started like this. Get an exercise program started. First, make sure you set aside enough, set aside the time and make a schedule ahead of time as to what your exercise program is going to be. All right, number one reason why people don't follow through on a new exercise program is the time. All right, they feel like they don't have time to do it. It's too hard to find the time. All right, so, so address that one first. Make this be activities that you enjoy doing, all right? If you enjoy riding your bike, well then make that a big part of your exercise routine. If you enjoy walking around the park, well then make that a big part of your exercise routine. Just make sure that you go fast enough to get up to the intensity that you need to, all right? If you enjoy gardening, find ways. There's definitely parts of gardening that are hard work, all right? That can be exercise. Make sure that's part of your exercise routine. That's one of the reasons why I love boxing because it's something different that a lot of people enjoy doing. It's and different and variety is good, all right? Before you even get started with your exercise program, see if you can identify barriers that may make it hard to complete, all mm -hmm. right? And we'll talk a little bit about that right now. So some of the most common barriers, we already talked about time, all right? But there are also convenience. Well, I don't want to exercise. <laughs> it's not easy to do. It, I'd rather be doing something else, all right? Also goes right in hand in hand with motivation, all right? Reduce confidence. We see this a lot with the people that we see here as patients. They're nervous about exercise because they don't know if they can do it, all right? And so this can be something that you can address even before you start your exercise program. See what you have to do to build your confidence. Um, oh, skipped ahead. Let me go back. All right. Access to equipment or facilities. Sometimes you feel like you need a whole bunch of equipment to do exercise. You don't necessarily. Having a whole bunch of equipment is great. Let's you do different things. But you can do lots of exercise just in your home without very much. All right? Fear of injury. All right? Again, just make sure you're safe. Being fearful of an injury is something that can stop you from exercising, but it shouldn't. Exercise is going to help you prevent injury in the long run. All right? Studies show that people who exercise are much healthier and have fewer injuries than people who don't. All right? It just, it, it sometimes it is a little bit scary to get going because you're worried you are going to hurt yourself. And just remember, we start slow and we build up to this intensity that we're talking about today. Um, other people, sorry, I keep skipping ahead. <laughs> so sometimes we find exercise to be boring. If you find exercise to be boring, then you're doing the wrong thing. All right? That's really what you need to do. You need to switch what you're doing and find something that's more in, that you enjoy doing more, all right? There's lots of things that you can do for exercise, so find something that you like to do, all right? The last one is the lack of support of family and friends, okay? So if this is a concern for you, think of ways that you may be able to address it so you can have either more support or that you'll be able to accomplish it on your own more effectively, all right? So some tips for success. Big one right off the bat, exercise in a group or with friends going to help address a lot of the barriers we just talked about, all right? Big one is it gives you that extra motivation. For our high intensity level, it gives you someone who's going to be there pushing you more than you would do on your own, all right? That's what we want. We want to push yourself so it's farther and harder than you think you might even be able to do, all right? It also makes you accountable. You have to go back and say if you actually exercise because you're exercising with somebody and if you don't go, well then maybe they won't go. So it makes you very accountable to someone else that you're completing your exercise. So again, find things you enjoy. Keep coming back to this. This is so important. It helps, helps us keep exercising when we're doing things we enjoy to do. All right? If you need to, you can actually break your exercise up. If you find time is really hard, that's your big barrier, break up your exercise throughout the day if that helps. You can do a little bit here and a little bit there. Try and get in at least 10 to 15 minutes at a time when you do it but you can break it up and you will still see those, those good effects from the exercise, all right? Variety, variety's great. Variety makes it interesting and variety gets us lots of different types of exercise, which is also good, all right? So, boxing. Um, I was gonna have Richard Steele here today. It looks like he got caught up somewhere with something else he was doing, um, but boxing is one of the best examples we have of an exercise that incorporates all the things we're talking about at a very high intensity. All right, we actually have programs that we've developed here with Richard Steele for our patients with brain health problems and with Parkinson's disease, all right? Because it's such a good way to get a high level exercise routine built. Boxing incorporates 
large amplitude movements, meaning you are moving fast, you are moving big, all right? You are moving at a very high intensity and you're doing so for a prolonged period of time. So we're getting that heart rate up. But not only that, it's hard work. A lot of what they do is it actually incorporates a lot of strength training and a lot of flexibility to be able to move in the correct way, all right? Boxing is a great example of a good, unique way of getting a very high intensity um, workout as an older adult. That's very appropriate, all right? Something that's very safe. Um, it's, it's something I would encourage all of you to think about and try. Um, we'll get to a question here in just a second. Um, so big things to take away from today, okay? Big one is push yourself. I keep coming back and say, you have to do more than you think you would normally do, all right? That's what gets us to that intensity that we want to get to, all right? So push yourself. If you have a group, even better. Let someone else push you, all right? Really, really find that high intensity. Make sure that you incorporate those four things we talked about in your exercise program. Aerobic exercise, heart rate up, sweaty, mm -hmm. short of breath, all right? Strengthening, flexibility, and balance, okay? Now, that high intensity exercise re yields a lot more benefits. Remember, it, if we just go at the low level, we see, we're, we're gonna see some benefits. We just don't see as many as when we really push ourselves to exercise hard. All right, so thank you once again. We'll open up for some questions. Yes? I had a question, you're talking about boxing. Uh -huh. My husband's been diagnosed with Parkinson's for 20 years, and he started in January going to Richard Steele boxing class uh -huh. uh, one day a week, and it's amazing the improvement. <coughs> he'll be standing in the ring for half an hour, he forgets he doesn't have his water, uh -huh. he doesn't have nothing for half an hour, and I highly recommend this. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, the comment there was that, yeah, here, here comes Richard too. All right. So the comment was that her husband has been attending. Hi, Richard. Her husband's been attending boxing with Richard for the last six months? Four months. And over that time, he, he's been able to see just a big difference that it's made. He's been able to walk around in the ring without the walker for up to 30 minutes at a time. Amen. Uh, it, which is one of those great things that we and love to see out of him. And his self-confidence has really gone through the roof, okay? All right, so let me go ahead and turn the time over here to, to Richard just for, for a couple of minutes just to talk about a little bit about how boxing is so beneficial to us. Okay. Yeah, let me give you this, the mic. It's indeed a pleasure for me to stand before you and talk to you and, and explain to you what I really love about this program. Uh, Cleveland Clinic is a wonderful place for everyone. It has done so much for everyone, and I'm a witness of it, and that's why I can speak from my heart about it. So, as I said, I'm glad to be here. I've been in boxing all my life. I started, you know, in the Marine Corps, and I, I, I represent... Uh, all of us in, in the uh, 1964 Olympics. So I know most of y'all wasn't born then. But, <laughs> but yeah, I was, a, I was a, you know, it was a pleasure for me to, to try for the Olympics. And matter of fact, it was the first time I've been to Las Vegas. It was, it was held here in Las Vegas in 1963 for the 64 Olympics. So that's when I started in boxing, and boxing has done so much for me and my family and everyone, so I love boxing. I love boxing. Once I retired from fighting, as you know, I, ret uh, I started refereeing. I was a referee for 30 years. So I've been in boxing for a long time. So when Dr. Burnick gave me a call, I mean, gee, it's like I've been waiting for it for so many years, and Dr. Burnick and uh, Jen Nash came to me with this program and told me, they introduced me about the program. 
They introduced me about rock steady boxing. Then we went back east to a class, Jen and I, we went back to the class and really learned how to do this. And I tell you, it works. This works because it's, it's, they, they took like 60 different exercises and went through it all. And they proved that boxing was the foremost identified uh, to help Parkinson's disease. It was identified to help Parkinson more than any other. It was a guy named Scott uh, Newman. Scott Newman was diagnosed uh, as a Parkinson patient, and he tried it all. He was the one that came up with this boxing, with the boxing, rock steady boxing. So when we went back, uh, Jennifer and I went back and took the class and learned the class and learned about how rock steady boxing started. And uh, you know, most people they would look at it and say, boxing, how come boxing? And that is, the, that is what we went back to learn, why boxing? And boxing is, is uh, one of those sports that just like turn the motor on. It gets the motor started. It gets your head thinking, get your eyes looking, get your hands moving, get your feet moving. It gets everything moving at once. And that's why it's so important to a Parkinson patient to be able to get everything moving at once. Be able to take long strides and be able to, uh, you know, it really helps the vocal cords of people just to talk. So it works miracles all around. And the boxing program that we do is just like the professional boxers does. But we do it to fight Parkinson. We do the same exercise, you know, and it really gets one to push themselves a little farther, get one to do a little bit more. Dominique does it a little bit more every day. He does a little bit more, and he doesn't have to say something, anything to me. I can see the smile on his face. So I know he's enjoying it. It is a wonderful exercise, and it's the same exercise that, as I said, boxers, they use for balance. You got to have good balance to box. Well, you got to have good balance to, to walk or to do anything else. So it works really good for balance. It works really good for hand and eye coordination. It works real good for the muscles to strengthen your muscles and, and to uh, that mental focus. That's what it really helps you with, that mental focus, where so you can focus on something and really you know, take charge of whatever you want to do. Then it also gives you the rhythm. It gives you that rhythm that you need to walk, to talk, or to do anything else. It gives you the rhythm. And all of these things are uh, 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 issues with people with Parkinson. All of these things that I just stated is issue with people with Parkinson. So we are there to help make those things better. So instead of focusing on Parkinson, we, we focus on the things that makes it better and the boxing routine by four, by by all means is the best routine that we have, as I said. It does the things for your memory, it does the things for your emotions, it, it makes us have our uh, symptoms for Parkinson make it a lot better, that we can have a decent life, that we can do more things and be more confident about what we do. And major, and that is a major uh, a factor, confidence. And build confidence for them 
to know that, oh, if we fall, we fall, but we know how to get up. Falling is nothing wrong with falling. If the only thing is wrong with it if you don't know how to get up. So we teach them that, and that's part of the balance. You know, rock steady boxing has been around for a few months now, and every time I read something about it, it's about people improving. You know, it's just like a young lady that came to the gym, and she came in with a, with a cane, you know? I have the cane in my car, and now she forgot it. <laughs> You know, and, and that's the improvement and, and the focus and the memory uh, uh, knowing that you can do it. And that's what we try to teach each and every one of our uh, patients. We call them boxers. Each and one of our boxers, we try to teach them that you can do it. And you can walk without the cane. You can walk without the stroller or whatever. That you can build yourself up to be stronger physically and mentally. And that's why when people say, how come boxing? These are the same things that I tell them, that boxing improves a person's a way of thinking, a way of, of feeling sure of themselves and gives them that confidence that they need. Is there any questions? How long is a, uh, a session, and how many times a week would someone do it? Okay, we have Mondays and Thursdays. We have two sessions a, a week, and it's for an hour and a half. Yeah, we start at 10.30, and we, we out at 12. What is the cost? The cost is $100 a month, and that is simply to pay the instructors. <clears throat> The Richard Steele Boxing uh, Program, we're not really, we're not in it to make money. All I have to do is pay the instructors and I'm happy. Is it here? No, the location is 20, 2475 Cheyenne, that's Cheyenne and Simmons. And I have my card for everyone to, to take. I hope you do take it because I would like to see each and every one of you. Is Simmons, North Las Vegas. Question Parkinson's have uh, there been any patients that you've dealt with that have Alzheimer's where you see any kind of improvement in Alzheimer's? Patients? No, not as yet, but that's my that's our next step. Alzheimer's and dementia. Yeah, that's and that's not coming from me, that's coming from Dr. Burnett. So, <laughs> yeah. so I'm telling you. I'm saying, yes. Uh, what, I can picture the eye-hand coordination and the balance. What about uh, impact, though? Does it uh, muscle does it... strength? Yes, the impact of muscle strength. It does build up muscles because in order for you to be strong, you have to build your muscles up. Isn't that right, Dominique? <laughs> <laughs> you got to build your muscles up. And these exercises help build muscles. You don't have to be a patient here, do you? No. no. What days were they again? Mondays, Mondays at 1030 and Wednesdays. Wednesday or Thursday? Monday, I'm sorry, Mondays and Wednesday at 1030. Monday, did I say Thursday? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Don't mean to confuse you. Mondays and Wednesdays at 1030. Yes. Do you watch one another? Or <laughs> no, no. No, there's no contact. Thank, that's a good question. Then you don't have to worry about it. There's no contact whatsoever. There's no contact. All you boxes, the bags and, and the mitts that I might hold or one of my instructors hold. Yeah, that's all. There's no contact. Yes. Mayweather or Pacquiao? Mayweather. <laughs> <laughs> Mayweather, Mayweather, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> Any more questions?
You okay. Guys, you guys can see why we love boxing so much. I mean, yeah. you, you can just see with what Richard tells you how much it can benefit. And from the coming from from the from the science and medical side of it, we love to we love to see all those benefits. And we're like Richard said, we're just starting to branch out into that area of Alzheimer's disease and dementia with box, with boxing in particular. But it's great for everyone, which is one it of the is. things we love about it. It's it's good for everyone, healthy or not. There's lots of benefits from it. So can people come and watch? Your yes, yes. I you know. You know, I recommend that you just come and watch. Just come and, and see the program, especially Monday's program. There's full and people as, yes. I have a torn bicep and a torn rotator, but they're one-handed. Yeah, yeah, you can do one-handed, but we can help build that back. Yeah, we can help you with that. 